Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning to you, and welcome back to Morning Musings here on Now TV. My name is Don K. Preston. I am the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. I do appreciate you being with me, and I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I uh, hope you had your family in. I hope you had a, a wonderful time of fellowship and family and good food. And, um, you know, the day after Thanksgiving, uh, I watched my Arkansas Razorbacks on TV, and they lost again. So that sign back there, you know, uh, yeah, uh, I may take that down. <laughs> Anyway, uh, thanks again for joining me. We have the uh, we have the holiday season coming up on us, of course, for Christmas, and hope everything is going to go well with you. Hope your hope your health is great. Want to get right into our continuation of our study of the challenge of Christ. Now, before I do that, as I mentioned in our last video, I am absolutely so excited about the introduction of my brand spanking new book entitled Temple to Tell Us. And I told you a little bit about it in last week's video. But the, the bottom line is this. All of Israel's feast days had to be fulfilled, and that's the final three included, had to be fulfilled while the first century temple not a, not a later, not a set, not a third, not a fourth, not a fifth, but while that first temple or first century temple was still standing. It was standing for the fulfillment of the first four feast days. It had to be standing for the fulfillment of the final three feast days, which foreshadowed, which typified, guess what? Judgment, coming of the Lord, resurrection. Folks, that's incredible. So, the book is now available. You can order it off of my website. Now, for the month of December 2022, U.S. orders only. If you live overseas, if you live, you know, where the shipping is extremely expensive, Australia, India, etc., if you would like a PDF of the book, under certain restrictions, of course, then contact me and I'll, I'll sell it to you at a greatly reduced price. It is available on Kindle already, all right, and thanks to those who have already purchased that on Kindle. But for the month of December 2022, U.S. orders only, total delivered price, $12.95. Go to my website, donkpreston.com, bibleprophecy.com. There's a banner right up at the very top, all you have to do is click it, take you right through it. As I've said, this book is revolutionary. It is a theological atom bomb. It destroys futurism, plain and simple. And I've got to tell you this. I've had a couple of people that I shared the premise with, and they kind of looked at me like, um, well, uh, okay, I'm not, I'm not sure I get the point. When they finally got the point, it was, <laughs> holy cow, that's incredible. So you, you may be like some people, you may have to read the back, read the book two or three times. That's okay. Once you see the point, I think you will agree with me, this book is a theological atom bomb. So, once again, go to my website and be sure to get that. Okay, we have been exploring the significance and the meaning of the appointed time. The Greek word kairos, that the Father conveyed to the churches of Asia through Jesus. Blessed is he who reads, who keeps and understands the sayings that are in this book, because the time has come. The word time is kairos. What I've been sharing with you, and the reason I've been spending so much time on this, ladies and gentlemen, is because, well, as an example, over the last couple of weeks on YouTube and Facebook, I've been corresponding with people 
who insist that the book of Revelation is still in our future. We're still waiting for the seventh seal, or we're still waiting for the seventh trumpet, or we're, we're still waiting on something that the book of Revelation foretold. Now, what they're saying is, we're still waiting for the appointed time. Because you see, each one of the seals of Revelation 6, 7, and 8, each one of the bowls, each one of the trumpets had a designated time to be fulfilled. I mean, after all, in chapter 8, you know, after the fulfillment of one thing, it would say, and now the next thing would come quickly. So there is no temporal gap in the fulfillment of the things of Revelation. God did not say some of the things are about to be fulfilled. God did not say the appointed time to begin the fulfillment has come. As a matter of fact, he says to John, Revelation chapter 1, verse 19, that John was supposed to write the things and to write the things that were, past tense, okay, some of the things that are in the book of Revelation had already taken place. John was simply recording them. The things that were, the things that are, those are the things that were going on when John wrote, among, among them being the persecution of the saints. And then he said, the things that are about to come to pass, from the Greek word melo, in the infinitive, which means about to be, to be on the point of. There is not one word in the book of Revelation that suggests that the appointed time for the fulfillment of Revelation was in any sense far off. As I filmed this this morning, before I came to my studio, I was responding to someone on YouTube who is trying to argue that the events of Revelation are like the events of the Old Testament. Paul says, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6 and verse 10, or verse 11, that the people and the events of the Old Testament were types. The proper definition of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, is they were types of us. He didn't say they are types of things 2,000 years away. They were types of what was happening in the first century. And as I pointed out to this individual, the things of the Old Testament were typological of the coming things of Christ. The things that were about to come, Colossians chapter 2, verse 17. There is not one single New Testament text, not one single New Testament writer that says anything happening in the first century was a type of something that had not yet happened but would happen someday, by and by, in the far distant future. Whereas in the Old Testament, the Old Testament writers were commonly told, these things are far off. They are not near. Daniel chapter 12, 9 and 10. Seal up the book because it is for many days to come. We have nothing, ladies and gentlemen, nothing like that in the New Testament. That's why I have been spending so much time sharing with you about this important key word, kairos. The New Testament writer, Jesus himself, and the New Testament writers said over and over and over, they were living in the appointed Time, the time foretold by the Old Testament prophets. It is far past time, a little bit of a pun intended, it is far past time for evangelical Christianity to stop denying the significance of Kairos and to deal with the fact 
that Jesus and all of his apostles said they were living in the appointed time of the, for instance, the resurrection. Now, last week I shared with you that Daniel is a prime, prime example of the Old Testament prophets who foretold the kairos. They foretold the appointed time of the end. But they knew, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, 10 to 12, the Old Testament writers, it was revealed to them that they were not speaking about things that were going to happen in their day, in their lifetime. Let that soak in. Peter said, it was revealed to the Old Testament prophets that not to themselves did, those, did they minister those things which have now been spoken, Peter said. There could not be a clearer, more stark contrast in temporal standing. Old Testament prophets knew the things they foretold not for their day. Peter, what they foretold is coming to pass. Again, let that soak in and catch the power of that reality. It cannot be denied. Now, Daniel chapter 2, very quick rehearsal here. Daniel chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar's vision began with the head of gold, chest of silver, etc. Daniel said what that meant was four kingdoms. Nebuchadnezzar and Babylonia was the first kingdom. The Medo-Persian Empire came after that. The Greeks after that. And finally, the days of Rome. And it would be in the days of that fourth kingdom, i.e. Rome, in which the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Folks, that is about the appointed time of the days of Rome. The word kairos is not used, but the concept of the appointed time is very much present. Now then, I want to spend the rest of the time today looking at a very parallel passage, and that is Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel chapter 7, we find the following. In the first year of King Belshazzar, now Belshazzar was the king that uh, he was the son of another Babylonian king by the name of Nabonidus who followed Nebuchadnezzar, okay? And Nabonidus was kind of a weird dude. He had, he had a tremendous interest in ancient history. Now think about that, 6th century BC. And this guy went off into the far reaches <sighs> This guy went off into the far reaches of the Babylonian Empire and began to dig around in ancient cities. He was one of the very first archaeologists on record. <laughs> he, was, he was really, really fascinated by it. So anyway, he handed the keys of the kingdom over to Belshazzar. So it was in the very first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed, then he wrote down the dream, telling the main facts. Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. The first was like a lion, had eagle's, uh, eagle's wings, and I watched until its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man. A man's heart was given to it. Suddenly, another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side, had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. They said thus to it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast had four heads. Dominion was given to it. And this, thus I saw... In the night visions, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces 
trampling the residue with, it, with its feet. It was different from all the beasts uh, made uh, that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them. In other words, the, uh, the little horn had already been there. He was just coming up among them. Anyway, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots, and there in this horn were eyes like eyes of a man with a mouth speaking pompous words. I watched until thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow. The hair of his head was pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued, came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words, which the horn was making, and I watched until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and for a time. Now, just like Daniel chapter 2, we have the iteration, we have the narrative of four kingdoms. Once again, we have the image of the Babylonian Empire. Do you realize, you know, when, when Daniel said that that first empire was like a lion, had eagle's wings, do you realize that archaeologists found images, statues, you'd almost call them idols, do you realize that the image of the Babylonian Empire was a lion with wings? Now, the Assyrians did that to a certain extent as well. But nonetheless, the ba that fits the Babylonian Empire. And the image of the leper, the image of the bear, and the image of the fourth beast, all of these correspond very, very extremely well with the historical imagery of Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. So what are we saying? We're saying here that just like Daniel chapter 2 foretold the appointed time for the establishment of the kingdom, we have the same identical designation and narrative of the appointed time in Daniel chapter 7. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, we have the prediction of the establishment of a kingdom not made with hands. It is cut out of a mountain without hands. And yet, it would be an everlasting, eternal kingdom. Now, I purposely stopped reading in Daniel chapter 7. I just wanted to get before us the fact that we have a narrative in Daniel chapter 7 that is about the appointed time, the same narrative of the appointed time that we find in Daniel chapter 2. Four kingdoms, four kingdoms. Now, what would happen in the days of this fourth kingdom in Daniel 7? Well, we find the arising of a little horn. Let me reiterate this because this is very important. It doesn't say that the little horn had never existed before. The little horn came up among them, came up through those beasts. That means that this little horn had actually existed but now was being manifested in a different way. Now ask yourself the following question. What kingdom existed in the days of Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece, and Rome? What kingdom came up through all of the previous kingdoms? Old 
covenant Israel. And you may be jumping ahead here, and you be you may be saying, "Well, wait a minute, Don. That means that Israel is somehow, some way, related to, or is being identified as the little horn." That's precisely what I am saying. Now that may be stunning to you, but I believe it can be vindicated. When Jesus was standing before the Sanhedrin, he quoted from Daniel 7, 13 and 14, which we we're about to read. Now keep in mind, in Daniel 7, in the days of that fourth kingdom, what do we find? The little horn coming up through all of the king previous kingdoms. <coughs> and what does that little horn do? He persecutes the saints. What is heaven's response to that? Well, Daniel chapter 7, 10 and following, the thrones are set. Judgment is set. And that little horn is destroyed in the judgment scene. Then we find Daniel 7, 13 and 14. I saw... And I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him, that's the one like unto the Son of Man, then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Then all peoples, nations, and languages, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. You see, this is Daniel 2.44 being reiterated. His kingdom, the one which shall never be destroyed. This is Daniel 2.44. Fourth kingdom. In the days of that fourth kingdom, in the appointed time, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Daniel chapter 7, in the days of the fourth kingdom, one like the Son of Man comes before the Ancient of Days. Now, the traditional view of Daniel 7, 13, and 14 is that it was a prediction of the ascension of Jesus. When Jesus departed this earth, went into the heavenly places, sit down at the right hand of the majesty on high, and there was given the kingdom. Well, there's no question that Jesus ascended into the heavens, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, and was given a kingdom. Luke chapter 19, verse 11, tells us that Jesus told a parable because the Jews believed that the kingdom of heaven was about to come immediately, from the Greek word parakrema. Pardon me. Now, parakrema, ladies and gentlemen, means exactly the way it's translated. Immediately. They believed that what Jesus had just done and just said when he said to Zacchaeus, salvation has come to your house this day. You see, salvation was the preeminent aspect of the kingdom. So here's Jesus saying to Zacchaeus, salvation has come to your house this day. The kingdom must be on its way, right here, right now. Parakrema is totally different from takus or ingus. Ingus simply means near. Taku means shortly, quickly, and soon. They do not mean immediately. So anyway... People try to equate the ascension of Christ with the time of the giving of the kingdom. But there's a distinction to be noticed. Jesus did receive the kingdom. Luke chapter 19, 11, Jesus told a certain parable because the Jews believed the kingdom was about to come immediately. And he said there was a certain nobleman who went into a far country there to receive a kingdom and to return. Well, absolutely. That's what Jesus did. He went into a far country, heaven, there to receive the kingdom, to sit at the right hand of the majesty on high, and to rule in the midst of his enemies until he put all of his enemies under his feet at his return. But that is not Daniel chapter 7. 
Because you see, Daniel 7 is the time of the judgment of the little horn. It is the judgment of the little horn that had been persecuting the saints. Now, ladies and gentlemen, and, and keep in mind, I once believed that Daniel 7, 13, and 14 was a prediction of the ascension until I actually sat down and read and studied and exegeted Daniel chapter 7. Daniel 7 is about the appearance, the manifestation, the revelation of the little horn who would persecute the saints, wear them out until the thrones were set, the one like the Son of Man would come, and the judgment would be given to him, which means he would sit in judgment of the little horn. Now, I had mentioned a moment ago, Jesus standing before the Sanhedrin. They ask him, tell us plainly, are you the Christ, the Messiah of God? And Jesus said, you have stated well, nevertheless, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Look, they knew that's a citation of Daniel chapter 7. Do you think for one minute that they believed or they understood Jesus to say, uh, yes, I am the Son of God, and I'm going to ascend to the Father? No, no. The imagery of coming on the clouds, ladies and gentlemen, is invariably an image of judgment. Now, it is an image of deity, to be sure, but it is an image of judgment. And so when, when the, the Pharisees, when the Sadducees uh, and the Sanhedrin heard Jesus predict his coming on the clouds, they understood, and he said, you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven. Folks, they didn't see Jesus ascend. I'm out of time. We will continue this video on Daniel 7 and Kairos next week. So thank you so much for joining me. God bless. I'll see you next week.